sounded so good as breakfast with Christ on the shore. Breakfast will never be better than this, than breakfast with my risen Lord. After an evening of fishing gone bad, Peter and crew felt dismay. Then seeing a man on the shore up ahead, Hi and welcome to our broadcast, Come Have Breakfast. I'm Pastor Colson and today I am joined with Joe Limbo from Shared Hope International. Uh, Joe, tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry. Um, I work for Shared Hope International, as uh, Pastor said, and it's it's uh, in a ministry that's been around for a little over 21 years. Um, we are international, but we're also very much active here in the U.S. And the mission of Shared Hope is basically to eradicate child sex trafficking worldwide. And we do that through pi three pillars, which is prevention, restoration, and bringing justice. But mostly we like to say we do it one life at a time, because that's really the crucial part of our ministry. Um, it's a very dark place sometimes to work. Um, there's so much going on that just um, breaks your heart and uh, sometimes makes you very angry. And you have to deal with that um, because everyone's worthy of redemption and the, the uh, you know, coming back and finding a new life in Jesus Christ. So, um, um, that's where I kind of spend some of my prayer time is, Lord, I don't want to hate these traffickers. I don't want to hate these pimps. I don't want to hate those who buy children for sex. And so it's a challenge for me. But as the national outreach manager, I get to oversee the trained volunteer ambassadors who are across the nation. We have over 1,200 of them. And I train them uh, with my team to go into their communities and bring prevention education. Because we know if children just know about this, that they will be safer and they'll be able to stay away from the, the tactics of the traffickers. So that's what gets me up in the morning is just um, finding ways to empower and equip ambassadors as well as I'm over the faith initiative for Shared Hope. And I do the same for churches, find ways to train them and put the tools in their hands so that they can not only protect their own children, but they can use it as an outreach to their community to protect the children in their community. How long have you been uh, serving with Shared Hope? Well, I've had um, a lot of different roles. I first started uh, as a um, activist, I guess you could say. It was in 2009, and I read Linda Smith's book, Renting Lacey. It's the story of America's prostituted children. And it opened my eyes. At the time, my husband and I were serving as associate pastors in a large church in South Seattle the Puget Sound area, and we were over the um, Sunday school, uh, Christian school, youth group, young adults, um, any part of our church that had children involved from birth to about age 21. And so when I read the book and I understood what was happening, and I had no idea, I had never heard of such a thing. I, I had the same misconceptions that most of our culture has where we label kids like, I don't understand why she does that, why she dresses that way, why she on the street corner. She certainly has a different design and desire than I would. And, and you know, we, we label them as, as making poor choices or delinquents or bad kids when uh, actuality, many, many of them are being forced and against their will, they don't keep the money and they're unable to escape. So that's what lit the fire under me in 2009. And I first started uh, as an activist. I bought so many of Linda Smith's books that she came through SeaTac Airport in Seattle and called me and said, let's have coffee. And we had coffee and I just expressed my heart to her and told her how her book had changed my life. And I said, but I'm not really helping anybody. All I do is talk. I just talk. I tell my hairdresser. I tell my neighbors. I tell my friends. I mean, people don't even want to go out to dinner with us anymore because <laughs> I'm like, you know, while we're sitting here enjoying dinner, there are kids out there on the street just blocks from here being tortured and sold, you know, and people were like, don't ask them over anymore. So I had to learn how to talk about this topic with hope because it is shared hope. And so um, after I was an activist for a while, my husband was asked to join the uh, board of directors. So I was a board of directors wife for about two years. And that was the cushy job, you know, just going to his meetings and enjoying the environment and not really having to uh, do a whole lot. Um, but then after that, I became a consultant and helped to open the first um, uh, transition home that Shared Hope had. It was in the peninsula of, of uh, Washington State. 
And I was the project manager for that until we got it up and running and got an executive director in place. So that's kind of where I got started. After that project ended, uh, I was a consultant and then um, Shared Hope decided they wanted to keep me around and so they hired me in 2014. I was regional coordinator in the Puget Sound area in Washington State for several years and then in 2017 we moved here to Arizona and I became the national outreach manager. So most of the time on the phone and, and on the computer and I'm talking to these ambassadors across the nation and to advocates and, and pastors and churches and people across the nation just to help them get uh, the tools they need and the inspiration and the guidance and to equip them and, and just help them to do what's in their hearts to do. So that's my favorite part of the job. Plus living in Arizona, I have two granddaughters that live here. So this is a pretty sweet deal to work from Arizona. Shared Hope is a global ministry, a global mission. And uh, you're making a difference all around the world. Can you um, share some of the countries that have a, where Shared Hope has a presence? Yes. Um, like I said, in 1998, Linda Smith was in Congress. She was um, a, a Washington state senator to the U.S. Congress. And someone called her and said, um, do you understand what's happening in India? And she was in as a Congress member. She was over women's rights, family rights, children's rights. She was plugged in and focused on those as a mission. And so she left on her own nickel during a, a break in her uh session and went to Mumbai. And when she saw what was happening there, she was stirred in her heart. Uh, she went to Falkland Road. It was one in the morning when she landed. She said, take me to the brothels. And so she went down. There were chicken wire cages with little metal uh, springs, no mattress on the bed, just the bed frame with the springs. And there were girls being serviced as young as her granddaughter, who was at the time, I believe, nine or 10. And she felt like the Lord spoke to her heart and said, touch her for me. And she said she, she remembers sort of recoiling because she said, here's this little girl, the age of my granddaughter, and she has the scent of a thousand men on her. And she, she sort of recoiled in the natural, but then she knew God wanted her to reach out. So she opened her arms. And as this little girl came against her chest, Linda said, I could feel her heart beating against my heart, and I knew I had to do something. So uh, within a few days, she reached out to her constituents here in the U.S., raised the money, and started the construction of the first Village of Hope there in Mumbai. So it wasn't long after that, they began to realize there were a lot of children coming from Nepal, and they were a thousand miles from home, and many of them came under false pretenses of jobs, or um, they were snatched, or families sold them, and they were brought to India uh, under this kind of slavery. So she realized that as we were shared hope rescuing them, they wanted to go home. So she built the second village in Kathmandu in Nepal, and those both have been under Shared Hope's care and um, support with partners like yourself uh, for the last 21 years. Other partners have come and gone through the years because they've been able to gather their own um, support networks and they've been able to garner support and we love it when they become self-sufficient and can move on because that's that's our goal for them. But some cultures are unable to do that because of the cultural bias towards women and children who have been prostituted and they're not viewed as, they're viewed as property, they're not viewed as people. Oftentimes they don't even have papers, that birth certificates or citizenship papers. And so part of what Shared Hope has done is we have stayed with, there are now two villages in India, one's in Pune, we just built that one last year, uh, 30 children with their um, uh, mothers, I say mothers, you might picture a 20, 30 year old woman, but the mothers can be 14 or 15. But um, we stay with those particular villages because of the cultural bias and um, the, the religious darkness that's in those countries that just doesn't allow um, support from the local community. But we also have a village in Jamaica. And uh, if people want to see our partners and, and hear some stories, they can go to sharedhope.org slash what we do and then look at partners. And that's where you'll see those villages that change and come and go in ministries. But there always remains uh, the two in India and the one in Nepal. And Jamaica has been with us for quite a few years now, too. But in about 2006, our board realized that um, this is happening in the U.S., 
it's right here. We have to do something about it. It's, it's huge. It's a cancer. It's everywhere. We can't continue to invest in countries overseas. We've got to come back home. And so in 2006, they, they stopped uh, continuing the growth internationally and began to work on what we call domestic minor sex trafficking right here in the U.S. But those three villages, Pune and the two in India, uh, they've been with us since our inception, and Jamaica's been with us for a number of years as well. We have one other program. I love it. It's called the WIN program, Women's Investment Network, and it's in the Vancouver, Washington State um, office. And it's a program where women who have been um, addicted or have been trafficked, have been out on the streets, have been involved in something that has um, caused them to lose the successful ability to have a job. Um, they come in to us after they are clean and sober and we give them a nine month program where they are paid a living wage and they work on the job training. And we've had, I don't want to overstate this, but I think close to 500 women come through that program. And that's not only in the U.S., but also in our villages overseas where they're trained and given tasks that can create an income for them. What are some of the challenges you face in your line of work? Personally, I think some of the emotional impact of this darkness on a regular basis, it can be difficult for anyone who works in the work. Uh, law enforcement, they see far deeper and darker things on a regular basis than we do. Uh, service providers, they're the ones that are trying so hard to bring these youngsters through and into a new life and keep them stable. And statistically, we know that a a kid will go back seven times before they stay out of the life. And I know when I was working as the project um, manager for the Terry's house, when we got open and we got our first executive director in there and we got our first three residents and we were so thrilled. I felt like a mom with new babies. And after about a year and two months, uh, two of the girls ran away together. And I was heartbroken because I knew everything we had for them. I mean, we had college funds available. We had apartments and houses once they were stabilized and could move on. And we had mentors and volunteers and people who loved them. And it really broke my heart. And I think that's the hardest part, excuse me, of this work is when you see the devil's reach and that's when you have to step back and you shovel those cares onto him who is able. And you have to know in your heart of hearts that he will care for them when we cannot and that his reach will go far further than our efforts and that he can change the hearts of buyers of children for sex. He can change the hearts of traffickers and pimps. And I have seen it. I have met them. I have talked to them and they've come out of the darkness. And so I think knowing that only relationship with Jesus Christ can restore us in times of discouragement, but it is also the answer for how it can restore those who are causing the problem and can redeem them. Nobody is beyond the reach of the cross. Nobody.